welcome back to this discussion on abdominal and GI emergencies. In this video, we're going to talk about the emergency treatment of these patients. And I always say assess, treat, and assess again. So, uh, of course, you're going to assess for the need for treatment and then provide treatment and then assess for uh, the effectiveness of that treatment and maybe the need for more. All right, emergency medical care. If your patient's condition suddenly changes dramatically, repeat the assessments so you can modify your care to manage this change. All right, if they, their condition changes dramatically, repeat your assessment and modify your care as needed. Uh, patients may experience severe pain, severe dehydration, hypotension, extreme nausea, and be ready and prepared to treat all of those things. Patients cannot have anything to eat or drink if they have abdominal pain, you should keep them in PO because if surgery is needed, food or drink could delay treatment and could put them at you know compromise uh, or risk for aspiration, those kinds of things. Your main goal uh, is to observe the standard precautions, maintain ABCs, and manage your patient's pain and nausea and perfusion status. All right, let's take a second and talk about pain management. This is often done... Uh, pretty poorly, pre-hospitally and emergently. Um, and I'm not saying that's a universal thing, it's just something that often occurs uh, due to, you know, pre-judgments and uh, different subjective feelings about pain and perceived contraindications. For instance, being a drug seeker is not a contraindication to any of these medications. Um, somebody may have a drug problem and still be in pain. And much of the medications that are given, especially pre-hospitally, are going to wear off pretty quickly. So they're not exactly uh, what drug seekers are looking for anyway. Um, we don't necessarily administer something that's going to last very long is what I'm saying. So uh, while it may uh, take the edge off for some drug seekers, uh, it's not going to last very long. So the goal of pain medication in the field is to make the patient more comfortable rather than to abolish the pain altogether. So uh, as we get a patient that's got a pain score of 10, we may give them a small dose, reassess. If they've got an 8, we may redose them. But if you go from 10 to 1, there's no need to you know, continue to dose them uh, to get that pain down to 0. Uh, that's not the goal. The goal is comfort, right? Not necessarily making them pain-free. Pain medications include uh, Demerol, which is a synthetic narcotic that is often given with uh, hydroxyzine to decrease nausea. Morphine is also a narcotic, uh, and it can cause hypotension and respiratory depression, um, especially if you give the morphine too fast. One trick is to, whenever you give any of these medications, have your line running wide open. Never deliver a medication directly into like a J-loop or a med hub. Always have it connected to a nice IV bag that's running wide open to dilute the medication and give it slowly, especially morphine. Um, and be prepared to give an antiemetic if necessarily, or if necessary, but uh, generally you won't have to if you administer it appropriately. Toradol is also a medication that's a non-narcotic and therefore does not tend to cause the hypotension or the respiratory depression. And it could be uh, given with caution in patients with renal disease or patients who are bleeding. Toradol is great for uh, renal calculi, which is kidney stones. Okay, so consider. Uh, you know, Tordol, non-narcotic for those patients. Uh, Nubane is also a synthetic narcotic that can be, that it can cause hypotension and respiratory depression as well. So remember, any of these patients, if they have uh, compromised the ABCs, you may want to avoid the pain management until you manage those things. And then fentanyl uh, is an opioid agonist. It is very potent, rapid acting, and it has a short half-life, which makes it very, pretty popular in the pre-hospital arena. It can cause hypotension and respiratory depression, but to a much lesser degree than the other synthetic narcotics we talked about, and even morphine. Um, your fentanyl is, if given, again, appropriately, nice uh, line running wide open, administered slowly, you're typically not going to see a whole lot of respiratory depression or even nausea. Speaking of nausea, we should probably talk about some of the anti-emetics that are out there. So Zofran or on Dancitron, is a, a common medication that can cause a damage to a developing fetus if given to a pregnant patient. It's not recommended as a first-line agent for nausea and vomiting in pregnant patients. However, everybody else, um, it's relatively effective. 
uh, you know, Benadryl. Sometimes these are given uh, as in cocktail fashion, Zofran and Benadryl together for the both of the hist antihistamine effects. Uh, Benadryl can be, is typically used for allergic reactions, but again, since it's an antihistamine, it has antiemetic properties. Uh, be cautious when using this medication because it can cause drowsiness and a drop in blood pressure. Of course, we know that about Benadryl. Uh, Vistaril, uh, be cautious when administering this medication to patients who have taken any medication that has a CNS depression effect. All right, so uh, Vistaril, which is that hydroxyzine, that can cause CNS depression. So can Finnergan to a, a, a different degree. A lot of times people will give Finnergan in cocktail fashion with morphine and their patient will become obtunded uh, because those are both CNS depressants. So be careful. It increases the CNS uh, depressant effects of other medications. Uh, it tends to cause a marked uh, burning sensation during injection. Uh, so you're going to want to administer Finnergan pretty slowly. Uh, if you're giving an IV, again, give the Finnergan through a nice line running wide open. However, you are able to give it intramuscularly uh, if you want to. All right, let's talk about fluid resuscitation. This is going to be the final thing we're going to talk about in this video, but it is probably the most important thing. In patients who are dehydrated, the overall goal of treatment is to refill the cellular space. All right, so we want to give fluids. Uh, the degree of hemodynamic stability will indicate uh, the use of a hypotonic or an isotonic fluid solution if you have the option. Patients in stable conditions should receive hypotonic solutions at the infusion rate of about 125 mLs or cc's per hour. This will move fluids from the vascular space into the interstitial uh, and then the intracellular space refilling the cells. All right, so if they're stable, you would just give a hypotonic solution, which is going to help shift the fluids into the right spot. And then for profound dehydration, isotonic fluids, that's your normal saline, your lactated ringers. These are going to be needed to re-expand the vascular space first. Cells are dehydrated, but decrease in blood volume is life-threatening. So you want to make sure you increase the volume first. Refilling vascular space takes priority over rehydrating those cells uh, because you're going to have decreased circulation, decreased cardiac output, all due to decreasing blood volume. This step is essential to ensuring adequate perfusion. Uh, to the body's vital organs, all right? So that's when you give isotonic fluids. The more unstable they are, the more isotonic the fluids are. Uh, volume replacement is critical to ensuring adequate circulation to the vital organs, like I talked about, cardiac output. Uh, very aggressive volume replacement can result in dramatic hemodilution, all right? So if somebody's bleeding and you give too much fluids, and remember, you're not giving clotting factor when you're giving normal saline, um, so you could be causing uh, not only higher pressures, causing increased bleeding, but also diluted blood, causing them to not be able to clot and stop bleeding. So you want to titrate fluids to a blood pressure of about 90 to 100 uh, millimeters of mercury systolic. Do not normalize the blood pressure. We call this, uh, you know, a permissive hypotension when we have a bleeding patient. We allow a little bit of hypotension. If the blood pressure cannot be maintained at adequate levels to maintain peripheral perfusion, then you may need to consider the use of something vasoactive, um, like a vasopressor such as dopamine, epinephrine, uh, or even levofed. Perform fluid resuscitation before giving any of those medications, though. You've got to make sure you fill the container before you start giving medications like that. Uh, once the patient arrives at the hospital, blood administration could be critical in their stabilization. So they might actually get whole blood once you get to the hospital. And with that, we end our discussion on the emergency treatment of the abdominal and GI emergency patient.